Hello, everyone. For those of you just welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Better Metrics, Shared Prosperity, Ongoing Work at Partnership. I'll turn it over um, for some intros, and you may begin your session. Thanks so much. It's such a pleasure to join you all here tonight uh, or today, whichever time of day and whichever time zone you may be in. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're really excited to dive into some topics of some of the latest work happening at the Partnership on AI. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of what we're talking about, and you'll hear from two of my illustrious colleagues about the latest and greatest work that we're up to. My name is B. Cavello. I'm a program lead here at the Partnership on AI, and I'm joined by my colleague Katya, um, who I accompany in working on uh, our research as it relates to AI's impacts on labor and the economy. Katya, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Katya Klinova at the Partnership on AI. I run our research programs on labor and economy. Uh, before PAI, most recently, I was at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government researching the impact of AI on economic development trajectories of skill constrained countries. And I'll also turn it over for a short introduction uh, to Jonathan, my colleague. Hey, I'm Jonathan Stray. Um, I uh, lead a project at Partnership on AI called What Are You Optimizing For? Uh, previously, I taught the computer science and journalism double masters at uh, Columbia University. Thanks. Thank you. And as we dive in here, I want to give you all just a little bit of context because we're talking about uh, the work at the partnership on AI, but the partnership might be new for some of you all. Um, so a little bit of background on us before we dive into the work itself. Um, the partnership is a coalition nonprofit organization made up of many partner organizations, the logos of some of which you can see here on the screen. There are about 100 partners in the partnership on AI. And the work that we do is really centered around this idea a partnership to benefit people and society. And what this means is that we work with all of these different partner organizations to advance work in this space, um, representing the many different stakeholders involved in our um, kind of shared experience of artificial intelligence as um, it becomes a more prominent feature in our uh, society and in our economies. Our partnership is made up of a number of members from different sectors. So um, we have academic partners and industry partners and the bulk of our partnership is actually made up of nonprofit organizations or civil society partners, uh, folks who focus on human rights and worker advocacy. Um, and you'll see this as a through line in our work as we think about what it means to develop and deploy AI in a responsible manner. We really are looking to champion um, this multiple, multiple perspective approach to um, developing best practices. In the work that we do, our primary kind of arms of, of uh, involvement are around conducting research, which you'll hear from Jonathan as one of our research fellows, um, as well as facilitating conversations and engaging with those many stakeholders, as I mentioned, as well as creating resources and educational materials, both for the general public and policymakers to make better informed decisions about how AI is impacting our world. But to get a little bit more specific about this work, I'm so excited to turn it over um, to my colleague Katya, who will talk about one of the projects that we have. But just a sneak preview for those of you who might be intrigued, this is your first interaction with the Partnership on AI. There are a lot of different projects underway that we don't have time to talk about tonight. So um, just a little bit of a taste of some of the types of work we're doing related to um, AI and algorithmic fairness in the law, um, things around uh, publication norms and safety critical systems, as well as um, thinking about how we can actually close the gap from principles to practice when it comes to responsible behavior. But enough about that, let's dive into the specifics here. And I'm so excited to turn it over to my colleague Katya, who will talk a little bit about our uh, very exciting launch of the Shared Prosperity Initiative. Thank you so much, B. Um, hello again, and welcome to those who might just be joining us, maybe jumping from another stage. Let me share my screen. Right. 
I hope you can all see that. So I'm here tonight to talk to you about a very new research initiative that we are just about to begin at the Partnership on AI. It is called AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative. Um, I am. I want to present it in hopes that some of you will be interested enough to pick up some of the questions that I'm going to be talking about in your own research, or maybe join forces with us, or maybe even apply um, to be a research fellow at the Partnership on AI. We are currently hiring fellows for this specific initiative. I'll provide all the details at the end of my talk, or you can just browse the careers page of the Partnership on AI. Before I talk about the initiative itself, let me talk a little bit about the motivation of where it came from. Um, so if you've been following the responsible AI space in the last three or four years, you've probably noticed dozens and dozens and dozens organizations have published uh, responsible AI principles. Governments um, did that, private sector companies did that, uh, multilateral civil society organizations uh, have all done that, which is really great and um, something one cannot not welcome. Especially at the time like this, uh, when COVID has um, really laid bare and exacerbated structural inequalities that, that exist in our society. And in front of our eyes, decades of poverty reduction efforts around the world are being undone. At the times like this, it, uh, it's especially important to remember that many of the organizations that publish AI principles, they've explicitly recognized the power of AI to redistribute wealth uh, and economic opportunity within the society. And um, many organizations explicitly said that this power should not be used uh, to exacerbate inequality, but instead of that to advance shared prosperity and to support inclusive growth and sustainable development. All of these are really important principles, but if you take a step back for a second and think about how to actually implement them in practice, that might give you a pause because it's not at all, uh, the answer to that, it's not at all obvious. And if you are, for example, an AI developer or an industry actor, you wanna use this power um, that AI has to redistribute the economic opportunity responsibly, there is not that much research that can help guide your decisions that you can turn to. As a matter of fact, if I were to summarize the future of work debate and, um, and academic research very crudely, it really takes technology as a given and it mostly addresses governments and society with its recommendations. There are people who disagree on whether we are marching towards um, doom and gloom of technological unemployment or a future of complete abundance. But by and large, they do agree that the transition on the way to, to whatever future is waiting for us uh, will be hard for many people and many people might get left behind. But a response to that, that the responses to that that are being widely discussed, they range from lifelong learning and retraining to UBI and strengthening um, social safety nets, which are all uh, responses that are being asked of the recipients of change. We're not asking of that much from the designers of change that are actually in the position of power. And there is something off about that and something that is um, something that we would love to address specifically with the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative. It is an initiative that's not only a research effort, but it's also a paradigm shift effort. We want to reframe the conversation and look at it um, not from a point of complacency, say, about AI potentially leaving a lot of people behind and calling for the society to adjust, but asking instead the question of how the path of AI, the direction of AI, can be steered to by design people who have fewest resources uh, to make adjustment themselves. So the current situation can be interpreted as a byproduct of user-centric design that has been popular in the last decades, um, where you find 
a market and you design for the need of specific group of users. But what can happen when you are focused on, on those needs is that um, the redistributive impacts that uh, have effects on other groups can get overlooked. So what would it look like and uh, what would it be like in practice to be aware of those redistributional impacts while we are designing and deploying technology. And so this is exactly the focus of the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative that as its goal has creation of practical guidance for private sector actors um, to handle the redistributive power of AI responsibly. As a, as a developer who wants to think about the redistribution of economic opportunity and economic impacts, some of the questions that you would be asking yourself have to do with um, whether you are enhancing or undermining, undermining the value of human labor with your innovation, and whether you're shifting the relative demand uh, for skills away from people without the college degree and towards people with elite education, which might be exacerbating inequality, especially in countries where educational attainment correlates with wealth um, and income of parents. Then you might also, if you are based out of a rich country, uh, you might also be asking yourself questions about whether the innovation you're working on is gonna be deployed as well in other countries where their main development challenge might be the generation of gainful employment opportunities for millions of young people without college degrees that are entering the workforce every year and whether uh, the deployment of your product there might be making this challenge more difficult and less tractable. This is by no means an exhaustive list of questions and the initiative is definitely gonna be expanding on those but the overarching principle that we believe is very important in um, this work is that any kind of responsible um, approach to thinking about economic consequences of um, AI de development and deployment must meaningfully involve workers. Uh, and this is why the initiative itself is going to be collaborating very closely with workers from automation prone um, professions to both shape and inform the research agenda of the initiative, uh, as well as the research outputs themselves. Um, speaking of research outputs, the way we are uh, imagining them right now is um, all around uh, creating an infrastructure for thinking about the economic impacts of AI from the point of view of private sector specifically. So, for example, as a private sector actor, as a developer of AI, what concrete objective can you as a company adopt um, if you would like to advance shared prosperity and make sure your innovation does not deepen inequality? How do you even measure progress towards an objective that you set up? And practically speaking, what are the tools, policies, frameworks that you can adopt and make part of your development process to start making progress towards an objective like that. Um, and then this community in particular might be asking a question about why should we at all uh, think deliberately about steering the direction of AI? Doesn't it sound very interventionist? And uh, why can't we just rely on the market forces to define um, that direction for us. And there are a number of reasons why the market might not lead us to the outcomes of shared prosperity and might actually be deepening inequality. And I'm listing some of them um, and citing the research from famous economists at the bottom of the slide, which I highly encourage you to check out in your free time. Those are all wonderful, wonderful reads. Um, there's one that I'd like to highlight in particular, it's the last point. If um, we make it conditional um, for people to be able to benefit from AI advancement, if we make it conditional on them continuously updating their skills, keeping them current and catching up with AI, then 
we we basically declare that we are completely out of touch with the reality of a global learning crisis around the world and the reality of how difficult it has been to um, improve learning outcomes around the world. That is not to say that we should not be trying to improve those. It's absolutely a very, very critical effort, but we should also be realistic about making technology and education race. Um, it is it is important that technological progress actually empowers and expands the economic opportunity of people who are less privileged as opposed to taking it away from them. Why would we even call it technological progress if this is what it does? Uh, there are many other reasons uh, why not just let the market uh, make all of the decisions uh, on our behalf, which hopefully we can touch more on um, in the Q&A. And um, I wanna conclude by saying that we are definitely in the very, very beginning of this effort. We would love uh, for people who are interested in pursuing some of these questions or who have opinions for us and advice for us on how to pursue this work to get in touch with us, please use the contact form um, on our website uh, or ping me on Twitter. We're also hiring research fellows to work on the Shared Prosperity Initiative. Here is the link to uh, the career page. Uh, we would love to receive applications from you. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan to talk about uh, a different research project that is happening at the Partnership on AI. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Katja, and um, thanks, B, for the, the intros as well, and, and everyone who uh, uh, is either up late or uh, tuning in from around the world to uh, see us talk about this stuff. So uh, I'm on a project called uh, What Are You Optimizing For? And I think everything's all set. Got my video, got my slides, yeah? Okay. Um, what are you optimizing for is a project uh, that is all about the goals of recommender systems. Now, you uh, may not be familiar with the term recommender systems, but you've probably used several of them today. Recommender systems are the um, uh, pieces of software that uh, filter the enormous amount of information, products, jobs, listings of all sorts down to the small number that you actually see in any particular day. Now, uh, if you've used recommender systems, you probably have some complaints about them and you're not alone. We have a basic problem that recommender systems are not really optimizing for the right thing. So um, you've probably heard this critique that uh, engagement uh, leads to all sorts of bad outcomes. So uh, things like um, addiction, maybe, or um, showing people extreme con content that gets them to watch, but isn't actually healthy for them in society. Uh, so if chasing clicks is not the right thing, what is? And uh, that's the question that the What Are You Optimizing For project is trying to answer. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to take you on a a uh, whirlwind tour of what the current state of recommender system design is, the, the interesting things people are starting to do to try to fix this, and even uh, into a little bit into what the future holds and, and what an entirely different generation of recommendation systems might do. So there's a lot of problems with optimizing for some like single specific thing. Um, you may be familiar with some of the discussion around this, uh, for example, from Stuart Russell's recent book, Human Compatible. And people have made lists of, of this, right? And we're not just talking about optimization by the machine. Most AI technology is based on optimizing for something, but also optimization by the, the organization that is building the system, right? So the, uh, you are looking at um, metrics like engagement if you're building a, a news recommendation system. And this type of optimization has side effects and not just on the people using the system, but potentially on other people as well. So, my favorite example is a traffic routing system might end up 
uh, bringing uh, congestion to neighborhoods that were previously calm and safe for children to play in the street. The um, way that I like to think about metrics is at a hierarchy, uh, is as a hierarchy, right? So you have, um, at the top of this, you have sort of very high level principles, um, actual outcomes that, of people in the world. So uh, things like well-being or agency. Um, sort of in the middle, you have things that you could say apply to individual recommendations. So for example, you could look at what Google News is showing you today and say, is there a diversity of sources or a diversity of viewpoints here today? Or you could ask, for example, um, if Amazon is recommending these certain products, uh, what, are the, what is the carbon footprint or the environmental cost of buying those products? But most actual work on recommendation systems is done at the level of available data. Now, there's nothing wrong with using available data algorithmically. I mean, you can't use data that you don't have. But often, there's a gap in um, both the, the thinking about what this available data is actually trying to get at, right? So you can use things like likes and shares as proxies for information quality. Um, but unless you're actually thinking about it in terms of information quality and not clicks, uh, you may not be managing the system appropriately. The other missing thing is, of course, you can go out and get more data. You can, uh, you can directly measure things like user well-being, and a few organizations are starting to do so. So I'm going to sort of walk through um, a real-world example of an organization, in this case Facebook, trying to incorporate some of these higher-level human outcome metrics in their system. So well-being. Um, Probably all of you have heard the phrase well-being, maybe you use it colloquially. Uh, what you may not know is that it has been developed as a particular school of thought. Um, it's sort of, um, you know, it's a very old idea, right? How, you know, how can we tell whether someone is living a good life or not? And uh, in the past few decades, um, people working in psychology and um, governance and public policy have really sort of dialed in on maybe not sort of the philosophically perfect definition of well-being, but a useful definition of well-being that corresponds to how people actually make life choices. And so this is what a well-being survey actually looks like. Um, this is a survey put together by the OECD. So it's, um, this data is actually collected across the OECD countries. And the main thing you ask is overall, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? So this is ask someone to think about not how you're feeling in the moment. There's other questions for that, as you can see near the bottom here. But how do you feel about your life as a whole? Now, in late 2017, uh, Facebook started thinking about well being. And in fact, the phrase well being started to appear in uh, blog posts and other discussions from Facebook about what they were doing. And um, Facebook was reacting in part to research that showed that social media could be either good or bad for well being. So social media can be good for your well-being uh, if you're using it actively, right? You're making connections to friends, you're going to events, you're interacting with people, and maybe bad for well-being if it's more like television, right? It's uh, sort of the endless scroll, the endless passive scroll, uh, and maybe uh, you're doing social comparison. You're looking at all these people living this amazing life, and um, that is making you feel bad. So they wanted to encourage active use because they thought that that would improve uh, the well-being of their users. Um, but it's difficult to measure well-being directly. Um, and so instead, they went after this concept called meaningful social interactions. And they actually told folks across the country to uh, come up with some way of defining and measuring and optimizing for this idea of uh, meaningful interaction, right? So um, what this ends up actually being is um, they uh, use their user panel test. It's an it's a ongoing survey with thousands of users. And it says, is, did you have a meaningful interaction as either on or off of Facebook as a result of something you saw on Facebook? And so they incorporated this feedback directly into the algorithm. So um, here's this survey I was talking about. They go ask these people. And um, they actually built a machine learning model to predict whether any particular post would result in a meaningful interaction or not. And so that became part of how they rank items in the newsfeed and also in other products like video. Um, and ultimately, this led to outcomes that you can observe 
uh, or at least Facebook can observe, like engagement. And some unobserved changed on uh, user well-being. Interestingly, Facebook did this even though it cost them engagement in the short term. So um, if you read their um, uh, earnings call transcripts, they actually say that it went down by roughly 5% uh, in the quarter where they introduced this. Um, so this, uh, this is, uh, I find interesting because it's uh, evidence that um, large companies will make these changes even if they have a short-term cost. Okay, so now we come to the good news and the bad news. The good news is that a company made the choice to optimize for user well-being, figured out a way to do it um, using social science methods and actually changed their algorithm. And um, by looking at the, engage the drop in engagement, you can say it was, it was actually a pretty major change, right? It wasn't some tiny little thing. The bad news is we have no transparency. We have no idea how this turned out. We had no idea if it had a big effect, no effect, or even a bad effect on users. So it's the beginning of something, let's say. So working with this idea that we can use these human outcome metrics to build better recommendation systems, uh, what other types of metrics could we use? So I'm gonna give you a couple other examples of things that have actually been done and some hypothetical examples as well. YouTube has been dabbling in uh, human outcome metrics or socially responsible metrics. Um, they've talked about a, a metric called responsibility. Um, we're, we're unfortunately, we don't know anything about uh, the, what it's actually comprised of other than that, which um, includes data from user satisfaction uh, surveys. So here's what these surveys look like. Um, they ask after giving, showing someone a video, what did you think of that, right? Was it a good recommendation or not? Now, I've never seen uh Oh Stinky Monkey, but apparently it is life-changing, so you should go check it out. The idea here is that you might get more accurate information if you ask someone to look backwards. So maybe, you know, you watched 10 hours of television, um, it sort of sucked you in, but the next day you're like, oh man, that was kind of a waste of my day. Why, would, why did I do that? And the idea of looking backwards has a long history um, in, in philosophy and psychology. So you may have heard of system one and system two, you may have heard of um, the, this concept in political philosophy of reflective equilibrium, right? The decision you make after you think about it for a while. Or if you've come from the um, AI alignment world, you may have heard of this idea of, of um, coherent extrapolated volition. It's all the sort of same idea of looking back and the idea that that's gonna be more accurate. Um, and so they actually last year released a paper where they talk about how it fits into their overall recommendation system. Um, so um, don't worry too much about the exact design of this thing. Um, the main point is that this user satisfaction survey is one of the things they are literally optimizing for. Um, Spotify is also optimizing for some interesting stuff. Um, they're concerned about diversity. And um, after a bunch of sort of internal deliberation about what does it mean for a playlist to be diverse, they said, well, it should contain songs from different levels of popularity. Um, and so they found that they could actually make their recommendations more diverse. So on the bottom diagram, going to the left um, without reducing the um, user satisfaction score too much, right? So they could expand people's musical tastes uh, without um, showing them stuff they didn't like. Uh, but we could go even farther. So you could imagine a recommendation system, maybe for Amazon, that took into account the carbon footprints of the product it was trying to sell you. So going back to one of these sort of system diagrams here, the idea here is that if you can build a, a database of the carbon footprints for each product, then Amazon could recommend to you products that kind of do the same thing, right? They're sort of equivalent from the user's point of view, but have a lower carbon footprint. So, so far, so good, right? And we now have a very general method for incorporating our human values, right? There are things that we as humans care about. And with appropriate choice of metrics, we can incorporate many different types of values. The bad news is we're still not talking about inclusive AI. Why do a bunch of engineers and researchers, you know, people like me basically, get to decide uh, what the internet is like for everyone else? And so the, the next phase of this, and now we're, we're moving from the present to the future, is um, design techniques for building recommenders that are much more inclusive. 
So here's the basic idea. Uh, we've been talking so far about better metrics. That is the near-term focus of the what are you optimizing for project. Where we'd like to do is don't drive the system with metrics at all. I should be able to just tell you what I want, right? Um, all of these users on whose behalf we are trying to pick good metrics should be able to just say what it is that they want the recommender to do. So there's um, some early uh, uh, experimental work on this um, with recommendation systems where rather than just showing you a bunch of items and having you click on one, you can just tell it, uh, yeah, I'm seeing all of this footwear, but what I want is blue boots. And then the next round of recommendations that come up will be blue boots. And it sort of seems very natural, right? When, when I, uh, why can't I just control uh, Facebook or Google News or Amazon or LinkedIn or any of this stuff just by sort of telling it what I want and how to alter the recommendations to better suit me. The catch is people have opinions not only on what gets recommended to them, but what gets recommended to everyone else. And you can see this in things like the dislike button. You can see this in all of the ways that content is reported. You can see it in all of uh, all like online campaigns to vote up or down certain things or like or reshare or make something go viral. And you can see it in the political discussions about what should and should not be on platforms. So it's not enough to just sort of say, we're gonna give users individually what they want. We have to solve the, the social choice problem of different people with different interests and ideas of what should be on a platform. And in fact, um, all recommender systems are multi-stakeholder systems. We normally just think of the user and maybe the system operator as having certain interests. So the user wants you know, relevant products, the system operator wants to sell things. But um, in many systems, there are other stakeholders such as the creators. So the people who are creating music that goes on Spotify or who are putting up things to sell on Amazon um, and also the other users, right? If I upvote something, you see it more as well potentially. And also non-users as in my consumption of a, a product with a high carbon footprint can affect you and potentially everyone in the world. So the, the um, recommended design problem is not just about giving individual users what they want, but about balancing all of these multiple needs against each other. And there's some interesting work that goes in this direction. So um, there's a, 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 an experiment called We Build AI um, where they, they were actually building a volunteer food delivery service where you pick up food from like a supermarket that would throw it out and volunteer drivers drive it to like a food bank. Um, and they wanted to sort of figure out a system to vote on like who should pick up the food and drive it where. And what they actually did is they worked with individual stakeholders. So drivers, um, donors who funded the operation, um, the supermarkets who had the food, the recipients um, to um, collectively sort of um, work out their preferences and what they, they say, build a computational model that embodies their belief, right? And then all of these sort of individual, you can think of them as sort of like digital proxies for what I believe the right answer is, um, collectively vote. So uh, I'm not saying this is how Facebook should work. It's a bit complicated for that, but there's a bunch of experimentation really grappling with this problem of how do you build an algorithm that fairly takes into account the preferences of lots of different people. Um, and in fact, this is what uh, the next paper coming out of the What Are You Optimizing For project at PM, PI is talking about. We're trying to move from trying to optimize these like individual objective functions and picking the right metric and all this stuff to systems that can directly learn using very natural human interfaces and intrinsically balance the needs and desires of multiple people. Uh, and so this is what that would look like ultimately. I should be able to just tell YouTube to um, remind me to finish the online video I'm watching or ask somebody who's selling me things, can I buy products that are more environmentally friendly? Or get my phone to help me with an addiction to a game that is taking up too much of my time. Um, or even ultimately, if, if social media is making me sad, um, I should be able to tell it to adjust. Uh, to, I, I should be able to make the, the software adjust to me rather than me adjusting the computer. So this is, this is the big vision, right? Um, ultimately where we want to go. And we, we start with metrics because metrics is where everything uh, has how all of this is managed today. But ultimately we are trying to work towards much more intelligent multi-stakeholder recommendation systems. All right, uh, thanks for your time. Uh, if any part of this is interesting to you, um, please get in touch. Thanks so much.
And uh, with that, I will um, turn it back over to B to uh, moderate our questions. Thanks so much to both of you and to everyone tuning in. Um, I'll start with a question for Katya and then I'll open up um, with one for both of you as well. Katya, um, one of the radical exchange core values is around dignity and you touched on this um, in your discussion of the Shared Prosperity Initiative, but I wondered if given your history of work um, in this related space, could you talk a little bit more about how you think of dignity as it relates to the Shared Prosperity Initiative? Yeah, thank you for this question. I think um, we became really complacent uh, in a lot of our expectations around future work, thinking that technology is just gonna happen to us uh, in a certain way. And as a society, it, this is a very undignified position to be in. And you know, the best we can do is just to adjust to the way it's gonna, technology is gonna uh, be deployed and be developed as opposed to take a more active, proactive approach and think about the kind of economic future that we want technology to enable for all of us and especially for people who have a few resources to make the, the adjustments that we've became so, so complacent about assuming. So I, I think there is a very um, natural, deep-seated connection to, to dignity and dignifying the, um, uh, the societal role um, in relation to technology. Technology is here to benefit society, not the other way around. Uh, technology is here to serve the society, not the other way around. So it is technology that needs to be adjusting not the society. Thank you. Um, and for both of you, both of your presentations touched on topics of agency and well-being. Um, but I'm curious, especially with these values around um, uh, you know, whether it be um, participatory methods for, for design or our multi-stakeholder processes within the Partnership on AI, if you could talk a little bit about the different stakeholders represented in the work that you're doing. And Jonathan, feel free to start. Mm. Yeah, so um, in general, Partnership on AI has three types of stakeholders, right? Three types of partners, right? We have industry, um, uh, academia and civil society organizations. So um, uh, we work across those in very much the way you might expect, right? We try to get everybody in a room and come to, to some sort of consensus on, you know, not only what the problems are, um, but the way, what is the way forward. Um, where we are going is more direct interaction with the people who are affected by AI technology. And that's, that's quite hard to do for a variety of reasons, right? So if you have a system with 2 billion users, literally 2 billion users, you know, who do you ask? Um, and so we're doing um, a bunch of, uh, of interesting research initiatives about that, around that right now. For AI and shared prosperity, in addition to the stakeholders that Jonathan already mentioned, industry, academia, civil society, we have a very special, um, stakeholder that is the most important to us, it's workers themselves and labor organizations and unions. It's really the kind of work that you cannot um, have a shot at getting right unless uh, you're really in close collaboration and cooperation with them and designing and thinking together with them, not for them. Thank you. Another question, um, Jonathan, maybe, uh, a expanding on what you were describing earlier around challenges, um, you know, whether you have 2 billion users or, or whatever the case may be, could you speak a little bit to why this, why, why this isn't already addressed? What are, what are the challenges people face when it comes to defining and selecting metrics? Well, um, so I think we had sort of a, um, I'm going to call it the first wave of recommender systems, even though we've had recommender systems for um, almost 30 years now. Um, you know, there's a big improvement from just randomly showing someone a list of all of the available information and trying to pick something, anything, right? So very early algorithms like collaborative filtering, which is it's basically voting, right? It's how, it's how Reddit works, right? Where you sort of just count the number of upvotes and the stuff with the most votes get to the top. Even that very simple click-based stuff provides an enormous amount of value 
uh, both to users and to the platforms themselves. So now that's old technology, right? Like everybody knows how to use that. Everybody knows how to write that algorithm. Everybody's using that. Now we're starting to look at the effects of, okay, well, what happens when everyone in society is using this, right? What happens when most people or a majority of people get their news as chosen by an algorithm? And when something reaches that scale, um, the small problems with it become big problems. And so that's where we are now. We have a bunch of big problems that uh, the technology industry was not really equipped to understand um, because they're not social scientists, right? Like they're, they're not ethnographers, they're not um, you know, public policy people. And so gradually what's happened is uh, more interdisciplinary work has started to, to um, come into the technology sector to try to address that stuff. And of course, um, PAI is, is part of that hybridization. Because conversely, the social scientists or public policy people or law people and so forth don't necessarily understand the technological context well enough to come up with the solutions on their own. So uh, it, it's, you really have to have these hybrid conversations to make any progress on this stuff. Thank you. A question from Divya uh, writing in, responding to our conversation around stakeholders. Are there particular stakeholder groups that you think are particularly underrepresented or not involved in these processes um, so far? And, and in your work or even just personally, do you have thoughts on how we can um, reach folks and make sure that they have a seat at the table? And um, this is for both of you. Katja, please. Yeah, let me start. Thank you for the question. Um, I definitely think that there is underappreciation of impact that's happening in developing countries. Sometimes people tend to think that robots are not gonna come here anytime soon uh, because of the income levels. That is really a big um, understatement. And there are definitely impacts on uh, the labor market that are happening today. A lot of the distributed workforce for crowd platforms, for example, uh, are located in um, developing markets. There are also spillover automation effects. You might be developing um, something for an advanced market where um, wages are very high and it may make economic sense for you to make an investment in automation. But once that investment is made, then suddenly the marginal cost of deploying those same technologies around the world is uh, dropping significantly and it becomes really difficult for people in developing markets to compete with these uh, technologies and these robots. It doesn't matter how low they are going to push their own wages, it's really difficult for them to compete. And then what happens is that even in countries that have very high levels of unemployment rates, um, automation gets deployed. And you can, um, you can see it with your own eyes when you um, go to restaurants and see self-order kiosks, go to airports, uh, see self-checking um, uh, counters. How does that all happen? So it all starts in different, in um, advanced markets where wages are different and labor prices are different. And then it just gets spilled over to countries that uh, potentially never ask for that and that are in much uh, bigger need of jobs. Um, so this is something that we need to be really aware of and thinking a lot about. And there are truly no excuses for not bringing these voices and um, these concerns to the table. Um, so in recommenders, um, you have all of the sort of normal dividing lines of society, right? So, you, um, you know, you have race, class, gender, all of that stuff. You also have a bunch of stuff that, um, is very specific to the particular type of recommenders. So if you have a system like, um, you know, an online marketplace, for example, you want it to support small businesses. You want them to be able to, to grow, um, and reach their audience. So, so you don't want just a small number of large suppliers to dominate. Or in Spotify's case, they were very concerned about emerging artists and genres, right? If there's some hot new uh, musical movement that's happening in one city in the world, right? Maybe just one neighborhood. They, if, if that's good music, they want that to reach their users because that's the product they're selling, right? I heard someone at Spotify tell me that ultimately their product is cultural competency. So um, it's not just a question of... Uh, 
sort of privilege or marginalization, but also um, in these particular types of recommenders, you have particular goals based on ideas of, you know, how should society work? Yeah, too true. Um, and I think in, in both of your cases, you know, you're talking about incredibly complex systems um, and recognizing the fact that from any particular vantage point, it can be difficult to kind of make decisions about that entirety of that system. And in the spirit of that, um, I want to I want to challenge you a little bit, Katya, because um, you know here we are at the Radical Exchange Conference. We've heard about all of these incredible ways to uh, use mar innovation in markets, um, and you say markets are not the solution to our um, automation future problems. Could you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. So I have nothing uh, against automation per se. The in automation. Um, is not something we need to uh, fight uh, just because. But um, pace of automation matters and a few other things that I'm going to get to in time. So regarding pace, it has always been true that technology has been uh, displacing some human tasks, but also creating some new uh, tasks for humans. And this is probably going to remain to for, true for at least some decades to come. Uh, but the relative volumes and pace matters. And so what Ajimoglu and Restrepo are showing through their research for the US is that in the last, in the most recent three decades, um, automation has actually been outpacing the creation of new tasks, which uh, you, can, you can easily see how that can be creating um, a, you know, paving a way for more inequality. And the other thing that exacerbates this effect is that it matters who you're taking tasks away from and who you're creating additional tasks for. So if you're automating tasks that um, people without college degrees were able to uh, do and perform and you're creating increased demand for the labor of people with college degrees, again, if, if your educational attainment in your country is correlated with wealth, then this is um, something that, again, exacerbates um, inequality, potentially. So all of these effects would not be tempered by markets, and we need to be thinking about those carefully. Yeah, thank you. There's, I, I know there's a, a many hours worth of conversation uh, on both of these topics that we would love to have, um, but maybe you can leave us off both with, um, you both mentioned kind of work to come and what you're excited about. Um, for folks who wanna continue this conversation and find ways to get involved, what's, what's next and what should they do? Uh, so for what are you optimizing for? Um, we are really trying to gather together the community of people who are building recommender systems um, on the one hand and uh, gather together the people who have uh, ideas about what recommender systems should be doing on the other hand, uh, right? So um, there's a lot of folks in the world who uh, know how to write code. There's a lot of folks in the world who know how to do social science research. Um, getting them together in one room is, uh, is really difficult. Um, so, uh, that's that's actually our main challenge is, is finding these people who want to work across disciplines in that in that way um, and um, you know I'm, I'm easy to find online we have a bunch of materials um, if you have any interest in all in this please get in touch yeah the first order of business for the AI and shared prosperity initiative is creating and publishing research agenda for uh, the in assembling the questions that we need to answer in order to understand um, how practically speaking AI industry actors can go about uh, supporting and enabling shared prosperity and making sure their innovation does not deepen inequality. So if you have good questions for us uh, and ways, ideas how to refine um, this work, please do get in touch. You can also apply to work with us through the fellowship. We would love to see an application for, from you. Um, all the information is on the partnership on ai.org slash shared hyphen prosperity. 
Thank you both. And thank you to everyone who tuned in wherever you are in the world. It's such a joy to share this conversation with you. And I hope you will be in touch. Um, we're really excited to bring more people into both of these projects. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.